Okay. I'm really glad to have you on the show. Thanks a lot for agreeing to talk to me today. Yeah, sure. So um, it's already recording, but... Yeah, I started recording from like the very form beginning. Form. Yeah, just because just otherwise you forget to start recording. I've, I've done no, that I, when I've been really? people for a podcast. Yeah. Oh, oh. No, I've, I, I, you know, I already... The, 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 the last couple episodes, I just started recording from the very beginning, and then I, I just try to find the spot where it would be most natural to start the actual podcast. Yeah. Know? Yeah. So I don't know. I don't know if people will be interested hearing our discussion about teams, but like, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> probably not. My my I, <clears throat> my. Uh, if anybody from Microsoft hears it, they'll probably make my life even harder. So <laughs> don't want to do that. So yeah, it's been it's been it's been a a while. We've been like writing back and forth, and it's it's glad that we finally found a date and a time to to having that podcast. And I'm really I'm really glad that you agreed to talk to me because. I've been listening to a bunch of um, your appearances in other podcasts, and you've always been one of the v most like reasonable voices out there. Not dogmatic, not uh, you know, kind of not too um, assigned to one specific camp or uh, too ideologically driven by a certain idea. And I like that a lot because it's it's, it's very Thanks. difficult to find something like that, especially talking about the whole diet uh, space and nutritional spaces. It's extremely difficult to to find someone who's just who can say things reasonably and don't, you know, kind of hate on other people because that's oftentimes <laughs> what happens all the time. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, I agree. And right. Uh, well, no, I appreciate it, and that's that's what I try to do. It's often not mm -hmm. sexy to talk like that, right? Because yeah. you don't um, <clears throat> sort of reel people in with this emotional story or whatever. But yeah. um, hopefully, it helps some people sort of navigate some of the issues absolutely it helps and i've also find myself in between these camps let's say in between these dogmatic approaches I, you know you, you kind of i don't know you can you can feel free just to, i'll ask you a bunch of questions anyway mm. so but still um i think for many people it's a back and forth thing between different ideologically driven dogmatic approaches you start by believing one thing then suddenly you start believing the exact opposite and so you kind of like a pendulum you go back and forth and at one point that was in my case exactly how i describe it and i kind of write at, a, at an approach that's more reasonable more in the middle and encompasses many ideas not just um if, if we now talk about the nutritional things more mm. specifically you know going from a plant focus to an animal focus kind of going back and forth and understanding that the truth always is sometimes in the middle yeah I've, <clears throat> so I, I did all of that myself right. as well over over the last ten years. How did your interest? Um, how does how did your uh, interest in nutrition came about? Are, are we starting the podcast now? Yeah, we did from well. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, now because now I'll give you uh, some more like formal formalized answers. Um, sure. So, so I probably first got into nutrition in an unhealthy way mm. in my late teens sort of sort of 18 or so and went from being a very sedentary um individual not eating particularly well to going t too far on the other side i exercised for three hours a day i was highly restrictive with my food because you know i had sort of created this idealized picture in my mind of what i should try and look like and and how i should try and achieve that none of which was really supportive of my either physical or, or mental health uh, mm. but it takes a long time to kind of figure that stuff out um and then throughout university first undergraduate and then medical school i um became more interested in, in human performance so i was a rower myself i coached a lot of rowing athletes and then also started to coach some other sports as, as well as sort of mm -hmm. from like a fitness performance kind of perspective and that's something I still do. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And nutrition came around, you know, sort of more into my uh, thoughts then uh, from a from a health and performance standpoint. And you know, initially, I dis I discovered paleo because I was interested in CrossFit right at the beginning of like the beginning of CrossFit, which is what twenty wow. years ago now almost. Um, yeah. And then they had they were connected to Rob Wolf and the paleo movement, and so I became very dogmatically pro, kind of like the original paleo, right? No dairy. So you started no... with paleo. Yeah, so I probably started with paleo oh, as like the 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 uh, the dietary approach that I I thought was going to fix all our problems. Right. Um, and then 
and then you know over time maybe moved more towards low carb accepted yeah. that you know dairy wasn't necessarily um a bad thing and then you know over time this stuff iterates itself so then you realize that some of the things that are being excluded are actually perfectly healthy and may even be health promoting yeah and um you know this kind of what people often end up in you know they swing from like plant-based or vegan mm -hmm. to, to animal-based kind of like carnivore obviously is is big now that's kind of like the <laughs> new the new keto um and what you realize is like each time you like you have this idea of what is quote unquote right and then you just find out you're wrong and like the more times you realize that you're wrong the more you have to sort of create this more holistic uh, sort right. of broad broad approach um and i also like to think of the idea that whatever model you have right all of these things are a model like these yeah. models for human nutrition like, yeah. we, we don't actually know i can't take an individual and say this is the best diet for you no, like it's no. impossible and anybody who pretends to do that based on genetics or stool testing whatever mm. like they're lying it's it's impossible currently yeah. maybe one day i hope hopefully one day we'll be able to do that um but if you try and create this model for human nutrition it has to explain as many observations as possible, right? And those observations include people who dramatically improve their health eating nothing but steak. Huh. And it also has to include people who dramatically improve their, their health, you know, not eating a single ounce of fat, basically only eating salad. Because yeah. those people exist as well, right? right. And if, you, if your model doesn't work for both of those, then I think it's an incomplete model. Um, mm. And then you just have to like try and figure out well, how do I navigate that and, and explain that and then provide it to other people so that they can use that um, to sort of navigate this space themselves? Right. I mean, I think, I think, I think what you just described is, a, is the best approach you can come up with uh, when, when you try to come up with an answer to, uh, or let's say it's a, it's a great approach we could use in order to apply the scientific method in some sense. Because, I mean, the whole point of... Uh, applying the scientific method is to come up with a model. I mean, it's nothing other than a model. As you said, we can't, we cannot, we cannot, I mean, what does come up, coming up with a detailed description of reality even mean? I mean, it's like, it's a model which we could understand the whole thing with atoms, etc. It's like, we think there are kind of balls and doing stuff. So it's a model. It's a model that we can understand with our imagination. And same goes with nutrition, every other scientific model. And it should, be able to provide an explanation for as many phenomena as possible. I think that's a really good model. Exactly. And now, and now I think the whole all dietary approaches that can maybe explain one one tiny, not tiny, might be a big chunk of the uh, observations that we can make in the uh, health space, let's say, uh, or if, when it comes to different diseases or approaching the cure or um, um, yeah of different kind of diseases, lifestyle with lifestyle treatment the problem we run into if if the belief system starts becoming too dogmatic is that now you're faced with two options it's like either you completely not completely but you partially at least overturn your entire belief system and come up expand it come up with a new model maybe even i mean if there are too many contradictions it means change the model or what or stick to a you know or stick to a model that's that fell prey to cognitive dissonance, which also not a good, not a good idea. Yeah, the um, I often uh, say to people, so, so I mean, I, I have a lot of friends who mm. and people who I really respect mm. who are, are very much within one, and it's usually diet within right. one dietary approach, and it's like that dietary approach. It's like baked into their email addresses. Yeah. It's baked into their social media handles, and I often yeah. say to them, well what happens when you don't think that this is the thing anymore? The entire right? identity falls what apart. Yeah, then your, your you, you have to strip back this thing that you created an identity around yeah. and try and start again. Whereas, you know, in, instead, you could just put yourself out there as like an individual, not a, attached to any one given approach. And then it's much easier to shift over time. You don't create this cognitive dissonance as you see these things that, you know, disagree with, with, with your model. Um, and I, I think you're more likely to become entrenched and sort of, you know, the more data you see that goes against what you might think, you know, just sort of like double down if it's already baked into your identity. So I, so I really 
discourage people from creating an identity Mm -hmm. purely around some dietary approach right because these things are going to change over time i guarantee it It absolutely that's the whole thing that's like the whole problem with identifying too much with one very thing because um i mean it's it's uh it's understandable and necessary to some part to identify with some something because otherwise i mean if you don't have anything that you quote unquote like identify with whatever that means some value system that you base your thinking upon it's like then you have no ground to stand upon and then it's like all uncertainty which is not helpful Mm. but if you identify it's like the whole debate between like conservative or liberal if it's too much too too much dogma then you're not capable of adapting to change or uh face change properly or do the things necessary to do when when something changes or which it certainly does all the time. But hmm. if you if you don't have that, it's also problematic. But people, why do you think it's the thing with nutrition? Why doesn't it happen so much with other fields? Or why doesn't it get so controversial or heated or emotional with other, uh, 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 let's say, whatever, fields, branches? Um, it's, pe- it's a peculiar thing. Yeah. Well, I think when you get really deep into any field, you, I mean, you find these these same, like, pockets and tribes of disagreement um so i think it's part of part of human nature and and again as a way to try and understand a complex topic that in reality we cannot truly comprehend which is a lot of the things that we do Mm. uh in science and and health as well so part of it i think is and in in that it's sort of like innately human to create um a group of people around you who have a similar belief system, right? There's safety in numbers. This is this is part of our underlying Absolutely. physiology, right? Mm. This is what we want. And I think when, you know, in this sort of like this disparate, disconnected modern society, this is how you find your people, right? And mm. and you always want to be part of a group and 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 have this. Oh, well, you know, had sort to of in the past, right? Evolutionary. Yeah, if you weren't right? part of a group, yeah, you're exactly. dead. I mean, yeah, easy as that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And and uh, so I think that people don't necessarily get that in other aspects of their life anymore. So like this is one way to do it. And in some ways, there's definite benefit to that, right? Because if you do start a certain lifestyle change, a certain diet, having other people going through the same thing as you to support you, mm-hmm. I, I think is great. So there is certainly really good aspects of this. Um, however, uh, everybody, because everybody eats, everybody mm-hmm. feels like they are they're entitled to have uh, an opinion on what's the best human diet so it seems right so yeah i think it's because right not everybody exercises right mm. and not everybody thinks about their sleep necessarily but pretty much everybody thinks about what they eat and there's, this is also something that's kind of baked into society as we've talked about um modern diseases mm. you know heart disease probably mm. starts started this and then maybe uh, lung cancer with smoking mm. uh but there are these th- certain things that it's in all the uh adverts for food uh it's in all the headlines right we became really hyper focused on food as this thing that affects mm. our health and so again yeah. everybody eats and you're continuously bombarded with information about how diet affects health i think it's just sort of become part of our society that everybody then uh, wants to have an opinion on nutrition. Yeah, it's interesting that you bring up the point with the hyper focus on nutrition. I recently had another guest one. We discussed exactly that thing, and I I was confused for some time because I certainly remember myself also th- the time where I was also extremely focused on only nutrition. I thought that was the end all be all, and everything just is about nutrition. Like yeah, yeah, like mm. exercise is good, don't smoke, stuff like that. But you know, there's just if everyone would do that, all of our problems would be resolved. So, and it's, yeah. it's all about nutrition. And then, then I uh, started coming across like, or thinking more about becoming more aware of the fact that actual nutritional, well, first of all, n- there are no real, really good uh, nutritional studies that we can rel- uh, reliably use in order to predict certain things. Um, mm. And if there is anything, then the hazard ratio the hazard ratios aren't even that great. So it's like you have this can increase your risk, uh, like relative risk increase 17%, something like that. Sounds big, but it's actually not compared to like smoking, let's say, where it's 30x, which would be what? 3,000%. 
that's something, you know? So things like smoking maybe are way more powerful, or quitting smoking are way more powerful than any nutritional intervention beyond, let's say, something that anyone would reasonably accept as a healthy diet. You know, there are different approaches, obviously, and we'll, we can get into that when you, when you might use certain approaches to treat specific diseases. That's like a separate discussion. But mm. I, I, I started thinking more about the idea that maybe the whole hyper-focus of nutri on nutrition does more harm than good. And maybe it even offsets the benefits that you might get from following a specific diet if you obsess about it. If you obsessively don't do anything else but research uh, or collect evidence, research, debate, like this whole heated thing and stress, oh, oh I shouldn't eat that, I shouldn't eat that. I certainly had that and I'm glad that I kind of, you know, maybe you, 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 one might even develop an eating disorder because of that. So the whole hyper-focus on nutrition strikes me as, very, as being very uh, pathological. Right. Yeah, and I, I, I would agree. And mm. certainly, um, we go back 20 years, mm. and I probably had what we would now call orthorexia before orthorexia was even a thing, which is basically um, this pathological focus on the foods that you eat being quote unquote good for you, mm. right? That everything has to be, you know, perfect that goes in your mouth. And that's certainly something that I um, struggled with for, for a long time. Uh, and we, I think now, if we fast forward, we think about, um, you know, in particular, one, one area that I've found where I've, I'm pretty sure you, you just see this in real mm. life is with things like continuous glucose monitors, mm. right? So now, um, we're, you know, healthy people are putting on uh, mm. continuous glucose monitors and every single bite of food they eat, they're watching their blood sugar change in real time. Right Now, don't get me wrong blood sugar um, levels and variability are incredibly important predictors of long-term health. It's So it's important data to have, but you can see, uh, and there are some studies to back this up, that there is a stress response associated with knowing that you're going to see your blood sugar level and then eating a lot of carbohydrate, and you are almost going to increase the blood sugar response to a carbohydrate-based food hmm. because of the stress associated with knowing the fact that you're tracking it and you're going to see that data. So it's almost this like self-reinforcing loop. Um, and I think nocebo, uh, kind of nocebo, right? It's nocebo, yeah. Hmm. So exactly. And there's, there's, so there's a study um, in diabetics where um, they measured their blood sugar after giving them two different kinds of milkshake. And they had them look at the nutrition label bef beforehand. And one was a low sugar or low carbohydrate milkshake. And the other one was a high, high sugar milkshake. Um, and obviously, after the high sugar milkshake, the, those in individuals had a bigger spike in blood sugar. But it was the same milkshake both times. Mm. So wow. the expectation... Wow. Yeah, so the expectation of a blood sugar spike, and these are diabetics, so they know that sugar is going to cause a blood sugar spike. Yeah. They're going to have to manage it with insulin, um, right? So they're expecting it. Um, and so there's this stress response associated with having to manage that, and then you see a bigger wow. blood sugar response. That's that's the hypothesis, at least. And so I yeah. think the same is happening, or will happen, or can happen, at least, with biohackers who are trying to optimize their blood sugar. And then, you know, so they do eat something with carbohydrate in it, they're going to be... They think it's going to be bad for them, so mm. then it is going to be more bad for them because of it. And it's all psychological rather yeah. than yeah. necessarily due to what's in the food. And maybe that's the reason why people also um, keep, uh, uh, what would you say? Well, why people are so maybe hyper dogmatic and believe so strongly in their specific uh, dietary approach because you, you, you not only have that nocebo side of things, you also have the placebo side of things. That people believe mm. strongly oh, yeah. that what they eat is incredibly healthy and that's the reason why... When they eat what they eat, they feel incredibly healthy. Maybe first, yeah. maybe they kind of switched their diet and they became healthier. And they, and I mean, it's it has po like the po the positive side effect is a good side effect, you know. But it yeah. and, and now the question is, how much should we reduce the positive effects of diet to the the objective qualities of that diet, and how much is it reasonable and justified to, um, you know, you know what I'm saying? Kind of how how much benefit should we also be able to admit um, that, that that comes from the placebo uh, part of consuming yeah. food because it's certainly a huge part of it. I, I yeah, believe. Yeah, absolutely. No, absolutely. Yeah. And um, and in reality, mm. I think we should try and keep as much of that as we possible ca possibly can for, for for a number of reasons. One being that uh, there are some data you know taken from other 
other arenas of psychology, but they say that once you start to really objectify something, like it all becomes about numbers and data, mm. it's no longer something that you can get pleasure from in the same Absolutely. way. Absolutely, yeah. I, so I think if we objectify food, just like we're now objectifying sleep with sleep tracking, mm. it's no longer this pleasurable thing that's just like an innate part of being human, you know? So like you should enjoy food and you should enjoy it with others as, you know, as part of a, you know, a group that's like a, a critical part of, you know, the quote unquote blue zones, right? Meals together as a group, right. you know, cooked at home, you should enjoy that process. And so yeah. I think that we should be getting pleasure in food and shouldn't be objectifying it. So that's, that's one right. thing, or we shouldn't object, objectify it as much once we put some like parameters right. in place. I mean, perhaps. I mean, the question should be also, what's the point of objectifying uh, food intake? Because if the point is we want to find out what's best for humans, then objectifying it is maybe not even the right approach because what if not objectifying food uh, consumption and uh, admitting that how you uh, consume the food and the pleasure you derive from eating the food might ha even have an even greater effect in terms of like on your health than just the objective qualities of that food itself, mm -hmm. then maybe it, it's like backwards. Maybe we should even, we, we should stress more, even more so we should stress the fact that the way how, the way you uh, consume the food in which setting and how much pleasure you will ultimately derive from it might be an even greater deter uh, determinant for your long-term health outcome than just looking at the objective qualities of the food you eat. I, I think there's like, there's an extreme part of this where we say, well, you know, we just want to get as much pleasure as yes. we want from food, right? Eat whatever and you like. That's, that, that's kind of... <laughs> put got us into the trouble that we're in currently right. as modern societies right so, so like there's this extreme part if you take it to the extreme maybe that's maybe that's a problem but it goes uh, both and, sides and, and, right right yeah but at the other side and i think that's where it's important to acknowledge exactly what you're saying and i think mm -hmm. anybody who has worked with individuals trying to improve their health through diet will have at least one story of an individual who just like they did everything perfectly like they the 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 best possible diet whatever you thought that was mm. plus you know all the sleep uh, and they did all the exercise and all this kind of stuff but in that process right they became increasingly say isolated right you you can't go out and have meals with your friends anymore because it's not paleo or it's not carnivore or it's not vegan yep. right it's difficult and you you're so hyper focused on getting to bed at the right time that you don't stay out and see your friends in the mm, evenings mm. right and, and things like that and then there is always this story where somebody basically stops doing all of that and starts going out and eating uh, pizza and drinking beer with friends and their health improves right because they've gotten rid of all these like restrictive barriers to some of these things that are really important for health and i think yeah. if you don't have a story like that then you haven't been working with people for long enough who are trying to improve their health in, in reality because every, yeah. everybody has a you know who's been working in a, a sphere like this um ha, long enough has a story at least one story like that and mm. how the, much how much of a bigger, big, sorry sorry go ahead i was just gonna say like the yeah. bigger the bigger picture like going back to your placebo comment is there's a the, there's again good body of i mean it's ep, like observational epidemiological data but if you ask people to mm. self-rate like how healthy do you think you eat um how well you know how how much do you think you exercise compared to other people like you if you think you eat healthily and you think you do more exercise than other people like you after adjusting for actual diet and actual physical activity you have better health outcomes so being very positive about the things that you're doing for your health is is beneficial regardless of what it is you're actually doing right. Right? this is the placebo effect is hmm. is in effect and i think we should support right. that so whenever so the, so the issue that I then see with that is, again, you know, you have these opt, you know, health optimization and biohacking podcasts where they're like, you have to do all these things in mm. order to like get the most from your exercise, or you have to do at least this much, or, or if you want to do, um, you know, one of my favorite ones is if, if you want to do zone two aerobic work <laughs> to improve cardiovascular function, you need your lactate to be above one point four. Yeah, and I was yeah. like, are you kidding me? Like, who does that? The average person right. is never going to do that. All you're doing is creating barriers. Yeah. So that person will now think, well, if I'm not measuring my lactate and I'm, I'm not doing X amount. Then there's no right, point even I'm... starting to exercise. Yeah, exactly. exactly. So I think we need to break down these barriers as much as possible and right. celebrate these things, you know, wherever we can. Right. If you go out and you do an extra 10 minutes of walking a day. Great. That's yeah. a great start. 
can do a little bit more in the future if you can. But even that is going to be beneficial. And I think that's the important thing. Celebrate these small wins because just the celebration, like appreciating the things that you're doing that are beneficial is going to be beneficial for your health, regardless yeah. of what it is you're doing. I think I think this part of uh, this whole uh, um, everything that comprises optimal health is always missed when people have these conversations. I mean, it's always about what do you do in terms of diet? How about exercise? How about sleep? I mean, even even like all the ha all, all the health podcasts and even the podcasts that I had with other people. Um, I mean, I came to realize the 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 importance of stress or the absence, the positive effects that come from the absence of chronic stress or mm -hmm. obsessive stress about what you do. Um, yeah. I came to realize that very recently, maybe over the past couple, maybe over the past year, let's say. But before that, I had the same approach. I was like, how about like doing these podcasts, talking to people and trying to tell them what they should do. It's kind of, <laughs> or what's the best thing, figure it out. I mean, I still haven't figured it out, no one has, but... Um, I was thinking of these pillars, you should do this, you should, like, there's nutrition, there's sleep, there's exercise, etc. But being positive about what you do, I think that's so unbelievably crucial. Even even looking at diseases, I mean, you could term it as an extra pillar. It's like, you, you want to you wanna mitigate your disease risk for heart disease, let's say? Don't be so negative about what you do all the time. Or, I mean, it's easier said than done. But I think yeah. this nuance should be pointed out before we start talking about different approaches. Because, and the nuance I'm talking about is um, between um, either extreme. One extreme being doing whatever, you, whatever feels good without carrying any responsibility whatsoever for your, act, for your actions. And the other extreme being obsessing so much that you can't even move. So, yeah, right. It's a very different uh, thing mean, to throw it out, though. It's a, tricky, it's a tricky balance, right? Absolutely. And, and we know it's unbelievably that. tricky. Things things are difficult. It's gonna you're gonna be negative about yourself sometimes. Again, yeah. it's it's part of part of human nature. Uh, but I agree that um, this focus on, you know, if you're if you're doing, you know, we we've talked. Well, there are multiple papers that come out now. They say if you look at the average um, adult in the U.S. population, they've done similar studies in the U.K. and with European data, and they say the you know the average adult is actually pretty sick. Right. Mm. They probably take at least they have at least one chronic disease. They take at least one prescription medication. They, you know, some vanishingly small percent uh, don't have at least one um, of the criteria for metabolic syndrome. Right. If you're then somebody who goes for a walk every day, you know, focuses on high quality food as much as much as you're able, you know, gets a pretty regular sleep time, doesn't smoke. Right, you're already doing so much better right. than huge swathes of the population, and I think that that's you know that doesn't necessarily that doesn't mean that you couldn't get more improvements if you did a little more, and that's fine too. But you know you, you should just acknowledge that you know actually you're doing pretty well, especially considering you probably have several kids and you know a, 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 a ridiculous job and all this kind of stuff, right? And that's difficult. So. Yeah. Uh, Acknowledge, acknowledge the wins when you have them. Right, and I mean th that's a great point you're making. With that, with that positive note in mind, what? How about um, listing or naming some of these easy to implement um, things that would right away kind of put you in the category of healthier than ninety percent of the population, and it and it's like zone two, one point five lactate, whatever is certainly not part of that. It's something no. that everyone should be able to start here and now without obsessing too much about anything and without the, yeah so that's kind of the that what what I'm what I would like to discuss with you today but before getting there I didn't uh -huh. really give you a chance to introduce yourself you already mentioned <laughs> you already mentioned that you went to medical school and that you work with people but what uh -huh. if you elaborate a bit more on that yes what yeah, do you sure. do now so, and what how how your how your journey was towards um what what you're doing and your interests and your field of research, etc. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So, so um, as you as pe you might be able to tell from yeah. the, the 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 random stuff we've talked about already, <laughs> and then what I'll talk about now is that my path has been very winding. Uh, so, so now I'm a uh, an assistant professor of pediatrics and neuroscience at the University of Washington. Um, the vast majority of my work is doing. Um, studies in the lab to try and find ways to treat babies with brain injury. Mm -hmm, That's what I did right. my PhD in after I did uh, my medical training and I worked as a doctor for a few years. Um, but at the same time, 
while I was working on my PhD, uh, I also started working with a startup company that was trying to focus on supporting the health of athletes. And we did a whole bunch of blood testing, urine testing, mm-hmm. stool testing. I did all the optimization stuff. You know, I've, I've, I've spent 10 years uh, in that in that world, and it's still a world I find very interesting. I just mm. don't think for most people it's very useful and can actually mm. be detrimental. Um, yeah. And again, if you're um, at the very pointy edge of performance, and so I, I still work with a lot of elite athletes, uh, primarily in Formula One racing currently, but also oh, just some uh, ran, a lot of uh, endurance athletes uh, as well in particular. Mm. Now, if you're right at the pointy edge of, of performance, then I think those optimization strategies can be can can be important um i just don't Mm. think for the general population they trickle down the way that some people want them to um so that's kind of what i do on the side so i do some side work as a performance consultant for formula one drivers i work with groups at high risk of traumatic brain injury trying to trying to increase or improve their health before some impact occurs and that could be in sports it could be uh in the military um Mm. and then i also do some work with um uh patients and populations at risk for dementia Mm. so again just lifestyle changes like what physical activity guidelines can we put in place for the average older adult to try and minimize their risk of dementia and some other things uh, around that so i'd kind of look after particularly so like the brains across the entire lifespan so like right at the beginning of life in the middle of life to try and improve performance and then towards the end of life to try and prevent cognitive decline so i try and keep an eye on that entire trajectory and obviously the physical body and the health of the phys- of the body, like below the neck, is really important for yep. what's happening above the neck as well. Oh, absolutely, and I'm I hope that we uh, that we can get very deep into that com- uh, topic today. And I think we should maybe focus more on the cognitive uh, decline and brain side of things because, um, well, because I think it doesn't uh, get enough attention, although it gets a reasonable amount of attention. But still, like the focus is still on heart disease and. Understandably so, because it's kind of the major killer, as we always like to say, and it still is. That's right. But cognitive decline is kind of a very sad reality that almost everyone, inevitably or not, and we we should definitely talk about that, uh, faces at one point um, of their time. But yeah, so that's a very interesting thing. And I think the brain is, first of all, it's an extremely complex, I just, I'm also a medical student, and brain is so insanely complex I think, I, I can't believe how I could even figure the brain out. It's, it's insane. It's absolutely insane. We just had <laughs> neuroanatomy in, uh, in medical school, and I've, I, I still have no idea. I mean, I have some idea of what, how things work, but I've, I still have no idea. It's, you've probably heard of that um, learning curve where, where you know oh, a yeah. little bit, you think you know everything, and then as you start learning, learning more, your relative amount of knowledge actually decreases because you understand there's like this infinite amount of stuff that I'll never figure out. Right, and I'm at that yeah. point where I know where I don't know anything. Yeah, it's <laughs> I'm at the Kruger very bottom right like, now. Like uh, early on, you think, "Oh yeah, I know everything," yes. and then you realize that yes. actually, yes. no, you don't know anything. Anything and, uh, as your expertise Fucking increases, nuts, you yeah. realize you know uh, less and less. Exactly, um, exactly. And that's and and, that, and that's right. Um, the <laughs> so I, I I think in the world of neuroscience, mm. I'm a slightly atypical neuroscientist because in general. I will try and zoom out in the other direction, right? It, when we look at the history of neuroscience over the last 30 to 50 years, mm-hmm. we've gone deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper into the brain, into the into individual cell types, into different subtypes of cell types, you know, down to the transcriptome level, proteome level, um, the you know, epigema, epigenome. And it hasn't helped us treat or prevent any neurological chronic neurological disorder yeah. or even a lot of acute brain injuries um at all really and wow. so particularly when we're talking about cognitive decline yeah i try and go in the other direction right what things do we know in the environment are as- even if it's just associated epidemiologically but then there's also an increasing number of interventional studies what things do we know regardless of like do i know the exact mechanism in which cell type in which region of the brain no, I don't. I mean, in the but end, that doesn't really matter. It doesn't does it? matter. It's, I mean, what matters that's, is... Yeah, it's oftentimes people like to cite, uh, uh, um, what, what would you say, Ex- experimental um, biochemical evidence to support one certain argument. Um, but then you're like, like you, are you familiar with a bio lane, Lane Norton? 
Oh yeah. He likes to debunk BS, and kind of one of his mo uh, one of his favorite claims is, "Who cares about this mechanistic stuff? Let's look at human outcome data and see what happens." And yeah. that's uh, yeah. And uh, this way, he he likes to uh, kind of to debunk whatever that means specific unreasonable claims that are aimed at backing up one very oftentimes it's a very very uh, bold s claim uh, that goes that ex extremely controversial and maybe there's some substance to it maybe some nuance to it but if we if, if we look at the human outcome data then oftentimes there's nothing to support to support it so maybe that's even a better approach you're taking here yeah uh, i mean uh, where we are currently mm -hmm. i think that's that's definitely the case um okay and you know what i have an undergraduate degree in biochemistry um i have a phd in neuroscience mechanisms are very interesting to me absolutely i find it very interesting i love biochemical pathways yeah. right that was what i did. like in academia that's like what i did first do you know why that's but the I case why do you like these pathways <laughs> because that's the same for me I, have, I haven't figured it out it's it's so uh, it's so stupidly fascinating to see these pathways and understand how they work. I have no idea. <laughs> I think again, it's it's this desire to try and understand something that we inherently don't understand. Oh, um, and, yeah. right. So like you're always trying you're right. to make sense of, of of something that you don't otherwise make yeah. sense of. And you know that feeling but, when when things come together and make sense. You like you have learned this pathway and this pathway, yeah. and they were separate, and then suddenly it it made sense, and there's that moment where it's like. Fuck! This made sense. Wow! Yeah. I I feel and, and I feel I feel ten times smarter than before. It's insane, <laughs> really. And and uh, who work in this like health optimization sphere, they'll bombard you with pathways, right? Yeah, and yeah. you'll think, oh my god, this person is so smart. Yeah, yeah. They know all these pathways. They must be right, you know. And I feel so much smarter listening to them talk. But in reality, You're right. you know, unless you like step back and say, well, well. Again, what's the human outcome data here? I think you get kind of lost. And uh, we, there's this like new, right? It used to be that we love to watch like cooking shows. We love to watch people cook. Like we didn't do it ourselves. We would love to watch it. Now we love to listen to smart people talk about biochemical pathways on health podcasts. Without doing right? it, it makes us feel so it makes us feel so smart. Yeah. Um, but in reality, the vast majority of that information isn't particularly helpful. Maybe it's interesting, but it's not. It's not that useful. And so that's where, yeah, this uh, real hard outcome data in humans. Um, and even if it's, um, if you then have, right, you have some epidemiological data, you have some in intervention data, again, in humans, you know, you can talk about the pathways that are maybe linking the intervention to the results. But in reality, it doesn't matter, right? Mm -hmm. I, can, I can give you a randomized control trial where they took uh, older adults, they made them lift weights, mm. and their uh, their cognitive function improved. Great. That's all I care that's about. That's it. Right? Yep. I could talk about a number of pathways about why that happened. Yeah, maybe that's interesting. But yep. what you really care about is these people had improved cognitive Especially function, for these right? people. That's, 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 yeah, exactly. that's what they care yeah. about. I mean, you might care about the specific pathways for whatever reason, because it's interesting, I guess. But um, these people, they don't like, why, why, why would they care about that? Yeah, and yeah. and most again, um, you know, when, when you when you exist in this sphere of people who are hyper focused on health, you assume that this is something that most people care about. Yeah, most yeah. people do not care. Like, yeah. they they would just like if you if you again if you actually work with individuals, they like why why are you doing this? What do you want to do? I I want to be able to play with my grandkids. I want to mm. like survive to see my grandkids, or like. Um, I just want to not end up in a home with Alzheimer's disease, right? Yeah. These are the things that people care about. They don't care about the the pathways no. or like optimizing anything. They just want to like have a healthy life for as long as possible. And it's usually connected to the things that they can do during, mm. during that life. That's what people care about. Mm. Um, and again, most people. So if you like zoom out of mm. these like hyper-focused health spheres, that's what the average person who thinks about their health really cares about. Yeah, yeah. And um, one question that bothers me a lot is um, how much of cognitive decline, Alzheimer's, dementia, everything that has to do with brain degeneration maybe, without these, without, um, we, we, we could take them account as well because they're also on the rise, the whole autoimmune degenerative disease uh, issues like MS, ALS, etc. Because that's maybe a different topic. But what, what, happens to virtually everyone. This natural, natural, quote unquote, cognitive mm. decline, Alzheimer's is prevalent, dementia is insanely prevalent, and so on. How much, because that's what 
they like to say me medical school, almost like everything can be attributed to aging. We just get older and it's a natural <laughs> process. And now we're looking for yeah. drugs, how we can just um, decelerate the process of uh, cognitive decline. And this, I don't know, this doesn't gen uh, resonate with me at all. So I so, just want to ask so, you that so question. Yeah, so, so you're right. Like, if you look at uh, like Z-scored, so like population averaged um, cognitive function over time, it basically decreases linear with, right. linearly with age. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there's always going to be this underlying process. Uh, but right. part of it, and I think that it, you could be the same for physical decline as it is for cognitive decline. Yeah. And actually, again, if you zoom out, I think a lot of the things that we know about physical performance, muscle mass, the stimulus required to do that, the environment required to do that, it's essentially the same for the brain. It's just like the stimulus wow. is different. It's not lifting weights, it's doing things with your brain. And what, in the modern environment, the average adult does not do very much with their brain. We may think that we're doing a lot because we feel busy and we feel stressed, mm. but that's not the same. Mm. Um, because what happens early in life is, you know, we go to school, we learn skills, we're climbing trees, we're constantly challenging ourselves, both from, um, you know, a pure cognitive standpoint, but then also this like coordination motor standpoint. That's a yeah. that's a, a cognitive um, that's cognitive demand as well as we try and function. wire those pathways. Yeah, and then over time, like. You go to school and you become more and more specialized you do and then you go to work and you do more and more of the same thing and you do mm. the same task again and again and again and if you look at the thing the two things that are most protective of cognitive decline the first one is early life education mm. and there's some socioeconomic stuff that goes into that right not all not everybody has the opportunity to go to university say or get a graduate degree you know, go to medical school um but in general the more education you get early in life and so i think of that as cognitive stimulus the more true cognitive stimulus you get early in life, the the lower your risk of cognitive decline later in life. And then the more you you challenge your brain later in life, um, the the less risk of cognitive decline you have. And, and there's there's a few ways to look at that. Yeah. Um, the easiest way to look at that is like what's the most common cognitive stimulus in adults and what happens when we take that away? And that is what happens when we retire. Mm. most of us get most of it most of our cognitive stimulus from our work and then as soon as people retire you see a dramatic decrease in cognitive function and that's Ooh. after adjusting for things like medical conditions that yeah. may 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 result in you retiring earlier or a specific time point. very quick quick comment on that you yeah you're, you're most certainly familiar with the whole blue zone controversy controversy yeah. and issue the the, the just the, the idea of the blue zones etc i think i think was it okinawa where they don't have the the word for retirement, I believe yeah, it was. I heard so it on, I think, on a German podcast, and he just said he was asking them, he was asking the older people when they retire, if they retire, what they do after they retire. They're like, "What do you mean?" I, I, we, they didn't understand the concept of of yeah. of of um, ceasing to um, to uh, engage in something that's meaningful and then that that's challenging mentally and physically. They are like. What what do you mean by stop working? What how like no yeah. like obviously not. We keep working until we are we fall over essentially. Yeah. So it's uh, interesting, think, um, and, and and that's maybe why they're a blue zone. That's why they have centenarians because they stop. They 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 don't stop engaging in 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 in, in work whatever whatever that means. But in their case, it's something that's meaningful, something that that transmits wisdom from one generation to another, something that helps to build up the community, etc. Yeah, and I think that that's, um, you know, there are lots of uh, things to discuss about blue zones, and everybody always gets hyper focused on on the on the diet, right? Yeah, of, course. of course. Uh, but these other things are important, and there's this, you know, part of this. I think, right? If if you're trying to tell your muscles that you want them to stay around, right? You need to keep challenging them. You need to keep mm -hmm. doing physical work. Um, it's like if you if you break a leg and it goes in a cast, the muscles on that leg get smaller. Or if you're a, you know you undergo bed rest, your muscles get smaller because you're not using them. And the brain is essentially the same. And there are multiple different ways that you can tell you know keep stimulating the brain. And one is yep. um, you know through work or learning new skills. But then this other part, you know, there is seems to be this protective benefit from teaching. And this is something that happens in a lot of more say traditional societies which is that 
as you transition into an elder, you still have a position in society because it's your it's your job or your role to you know pass things on to the next generation, right? So even if you're not maybe out there doing physical work anymore, you're still you still have this role as a teacher, um, and this is something that can that you can do essentially for for your entire life. So mm. you know even if um, you know you, you're in modern society and um, right you you do have to retire because people do. The, the important thing to do is then make sure that you continue to, sti- you know, provide cognitive stimulus. And it's not just like doing a, a crossword or Sudoku. It's learning new skills, learning new languages, interacting with others, teaching others. Um, you know, these are the things that really provide cognitive demand that then, you know, provide the environment for like supporting long term brain health. Wow. Yeah, I think there like a so, couple things. First of all, um, I think these are all great points, by the way. Um, for s- okay, so I think the term cognitive, like challenging your, yourself cognitively, is a little bit vague because how do you distinguish being stressed out because you have so much to do from challenging yourself cognitively? Because yeah. sometimes, and stress, because stress doesn't necessarily have a bad connotation, although in today's society it has, but not objectively it's not necessarily something that's negative something if you're stressed about something if, if there's something that's that stresses you that throws you out of balance it might be cognitively challenging right so if you mm. if you give a lecture of course that's cognitively, cognitively cognitively challenging you have to you have to concise this information and convey it in a manner that's understandable and comprehensible to your students and they should like you that that would, that would be a good thing and they should Get come out of the lectures having the impression that they gained something valuable, and so you might be cognitively challenged and maybe stressed out by that, and that's perhaps not a good thing. It's still got good for your brain. So how do you, you know, how do you draw a distinction between between these two things? Yeah. So so your your question is the perfect one. And again, I the way that I think about this is the same way that I would think about exercise, which is that if you want to get fitter or stronger you have a defined period of training where usually you're working up to the edge of your current capacity, you Mm -hmm. know, a lot of the time, and then you need a period of rest and recovery, right? That's when you get stronger. That's when you build, when you build muscle and, and the things that provide this true beneficial cognitive demand, I think fall into the same bucket. So if you think about learning a skill, say you're learning a language, Mm. You start by working right at the edge of what you're currently capable of. And you sort of, you know, you learn a bit more vocabulary. You you, you learn how to uh, string a sentence together, uh, grammatical points. And you can probably only do that for like 30 minutes, right? Really at the edge of your current skills, yeah. because then you start to get frustrated. You know, Tired. you know, you can, you can kind of feel that you're, you, you know, you're cognitively slowing down because it's difficult. So things that where you're learning a new skill, in that kind of time period, like 20 or 30 minutes, right at the edge of what you're currently capable of, with then a period of rest and recovery that usually requires sleep because that's important for consolidation. Mm. That's what I think about the things that are beneficial from a a cognitive challenge standpoint. The the alternative, right, um, is say you go running all day and you never stop. We know that's going to be detrimental to your health, right? You're you're never going to rest and recover. You're never going to adapt. All you're going to do is continuously wear yourself down. And these things that are like continuously feel psychologically and cognitively difficult, Hmm. which is basically like, you know, working all day, every day, you don't have that, you don't have that ability to then push yourself Hmm. and then recover. And so that's, you know, that's how I draw, draw a distinction between those two things. And if, and I think, again, because people are more familiar with it, drawing a parallel to how you would train in order to improve physical performance, I think it's very similar, um, yeah. both the, the the time and the structure of the demand itself and the need for recovery right. is similar in, in the cognitive sphere as well. Well, in some, in some sense, you can draw an analogy between what you just said and like life in general, because you'll, you're, it's like you have to find something that's in a balance between something that's too chaotic, too uncertain, too throwing you out of balance, etc., and something that provides you with security and certainty, you know? So you have to be in between these things because too much security, too much certainty is extremely boring. Like, if you, you have nothing to... Stand around in a room and you... 
Like the, that's definition of everything is predictable. It means it's boring because it, everything is already predictable. And we like unpredictability because that means something is more interesting and engaging. And that's the whole point of learning new stuff because it's engaging, especially if you're on that edge because it means, I think that's how people learn languages. Uh, if, if, the, if they don't already know like 80% of what they're listening to, let's say, or um, so they have to have a, 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 a foundation of what they already know and on top of that, they push themselves a little bit further. Same with exercise. You can't do an exercise. You can't get better at, at let's say, uh, bench press if you don't even have a baseline strength of like pushing. You know, you can't start. You can't get start get try, uh, getting better at benching uh, 100 pounds. You you wanna you wanna uh, get 200 pounds. Let's say. Well, you should first start at a weight that you can handle and push yourself a little bit beyond that. And that's how you how you progress. So I think this balance is. I mean, it's just crucial. It's unbelievably crucial. The problem is, how do I how do I put it? I mean, the problem is that, well, how do you implement it in the real world? Real world, I guess, because people are stressed out all the time. What would you say? You can't say work less. You can't tell people. Yeah. You know, you know what I mean. It's a very difficult issue to resolve. Yeah. So, so I think part of the. Um... So, so, so everything that you talked about, mm. basically, well, in, in my mind, mm. falls under this idea that there are these beneficial stressors that create resilience, yeah. be they physiological, you know, cognitive, psychological. Yeah. Um, and if we give our give ourselves the opportunity to have these brief stressors, exercise something that's that's truly cognitively challenging in like a, a skill building, you know, adaptation kind of way. Then I think you become more resilient to these other things. Wow. So yeah. no, it just you just need. Yeah. It, it probably doesn't take um, much time, um, but you know. So say you give yourself twenty or thirty minutes to go for a walk. If if you're sedentary and you walk for twenty or thirty minutes, you know, brisk walk, that's great, and it's going to do so many things. Right? You're going to improve your sleep mm. uh, because we know that. Uh, any kind of movement during the day usually improves sleep quality, mm. it, even if it doesn't improve sleep quantity, but it can improve both. So Absolutely. then once you've slept better, whatever the general work or the family stress or whatever you, that you have, you know, you become more resilient to those the, you know, that, that you decrease your baseline stress. Mm. So even just, so just giving ourselves the time to, to build in these quote unquote stresses creates this physiological resilience and there's some nice data that shows that mm. if you're a regular exerciser compared to somebody who isn't when you're put under a psychological stress test you get less of a, a, a negative change in mood because you're more cognitively resilient because of this other thing that you that you do in your life that's that's difficult um and it doesn't need to be that difficult right going for a brisk walk is is not that difficult i think anybody can yeah. do it unless they live in an area where it's not safe to right that's another issue but we'll always have these other issues going on they're important to talk about as well, but so that's how I think about it. Yeah, uh, you can't just say, you know, be less stressed, do less work. No, of course, for most people, that's not going to be possible. But if you if they can just carve out the space just to slowly build up these other things, you know, maybe it is learning a new language, maybe it is going for a walk, or you know, lifting weights a couple of times a week, or just you know, bands or push-ups or squats at home. Mm. Right? It doesn't need to be. You don't need a gym. Mm. As you do that, you create more resilience and you improve other things elsewhere. And then the, you have this knock-on effect. So that's that's the way that I think about applying it in the real world. Yeah. No, I think that's... I mean, you can even look at the positive feedback loop between exercise and sleep. You exercise, you sleep better, and you have now more, I don't know, like motivation to go and exercise even more. Now you exercise yeah. more, you sleep even better, and that's, you know, how it um, goes on and on and on. But... I. I believe, and tell me what you think about that, there is some extra benefit to be derived from going, uh, like, um, talking about exercise now, but you could apply the same idea to many other fields. But I have recognized that in my case with exercise, that the, the, the fact of me pushing myself extremely hard during an exercise session very frequently, and also like in competition, etc., kind of, you know, pushes my tolerance for stress up very 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 high because i expose myself regularly to something that's virtually intolerable anymore it's like you know you probably know that because you ex you, you're also exercising like mad and you 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 take part in competitions and it's extremely taxing and 
I, I, I recently had, are you familiar with the High Rocks competition? You probably are. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I participated in High Rocks in Bremen here in Germany because um, I'm from Berlin. And man, that was one of the hardest things I ever did. And afterwards, like the day after the competition, I was sick. I was unbelievably sick for a day. I had everything <laughs> I could imagine. I had fever. I had headache. I, I was like, I had nausea and I, I was extremely sick. I had gastrointestinal issues. I couldn't eat for a day. And just for a day, the next day, I was 100% fine, as if nothing was happening the day before. But I don't know what happened, but I pushed myself beyond what I could tolerate, that's for sure. And th this, what this taught me is that, hey, if I can tolerate these things physically and mentally and psychologically, then I can tolerate like everything else. So I think there is something independent to the, um, um, I don't know, the, the, the uh, independent effects of uh, light, moderate exercise on sleep and nutrition and you know, all these things of pushing yourself very hard in specific circumstances without overdoing it, though. And that's a very important nuance. Yeah, and, and that, that, that's right. I think there's mm -hmm. there's something really beneficial from, you know, about knowing what you're truly capable of. And I'm not, and I'm not yeah. sure everybody, um, you know, most people probably don't get the opportunity to, to know that. And I think that's there is a huge amount of benefit there because you're yeah. right. It sort of it, it recalibrates. You know, and this is there's both uh, conscious and subconscious uh, mm. parts of that. Uh, you know, to your um, your physiology and physical performance. The 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 you know then you know as as we go in that direction, and that's what we recommend. You obviously have to acknowledge that things can go the other way. So, like, <laughs> I, if I I think about your equivalent, my equivalent of your high reps competition is I did what was supposed to be what I think was the world's first ever fully off-road Ironman triathlon <laughs> it was a 20 it was a 24 hour it was a 24 hour race Oof. um and uh, yeah so it was like a, a sea swim and then we mountain biked overnight yeah the same distance as you would and then there was a it was actually ended up being a 30 mile trail run because there'd been torrential rainstorms so they had to re they had to reroute the marathon it ended up being four miles longer um oh no and it took me i think it took me about 20, 20 hours to Fuck. do this thing overnight well and I mean, I was doesn't sick it, doesn't equate days. doesn't equate to the damn Hyrux challenge. Yeah. I, no, but I was just like I was sick for days yes. after that. Like I did, I did, I you know there was unimaginable toll that I took on my body. It probably yeah. wasn't good for me in any way. Yes, no. I I don't regret it. It's it's nice to know that I'm capable of that. Exactly. But there's this there's this equivalent thing which is that you know people who are used to pushing themselves then think that they can just endlessly push themselves and you know i'm just capable of anything i shouldn't have to slow down you know i can keep pushing myself yeah and i think we create this mentality where like oh you could just keep asking for more and more and more and more and more and you're never going to have a problem and then right that's when you get burnout overtraining so like yes uh, i think all of this is important with the caveat that caveat, yeah. the body is always going to need rest and recovery to you know adequately adapt yep. and that can be sleep it can be time away from work right it can be time you know with loved ones you know true social connection right and it, that stuff that restorative part is always going to be important as well so not just go hard or go home every day every like 25 7 go hard or go ho or go home <laughs> and if you if you dare to take a rest day then you're whatever you're it's a weak excuse and you're no one and you should, you should get your ass out and train hard i mean it mentally it has something even if you overdo it it makes you kind of tough and it makes you very resistant and resilient to like real life stressors you know if you have a if you have a if you have a um an argument with a loved one let's say with a family member or just with a colleague at work then you can handle that's how i feel about it i can handle stressful situations that other people would be overwhelmed about um very easily Either I don't but, but, I don't care about them too much because I'm used yeah. to suffer much more like in my training session. So I, I look into that and be like, no, that's that's not enough to make me suffer. That's for sure. Yeah, but but I, th I think uh, uh, and again I agree that there's this mm. benefit to that and it you know again there's lots of nice data to support right. this sort of mm. r resilience uh, idea f from those things. But it's worth bearing in mind that. Mm as you get older and all these other things start to compound, mm. right? Not everybody necessarily has, you know, the the privilege or the capacity to, to step back from anything. So if you're like, if you're working multiple jobs and you have financial stress and you have family stress and, you know, you actually don't have enough time to sleep because you're, you're looking after your kids, like 
it's very difficult to untangle yourself from all of that and say, well, you know, some extra exercise is going to make me more resilient because already you're already at the red line. You're already right. like being, you know, uh, you know, taxed every day, you know, beyond your your ability to adapt. So it's just so, yes, these things are important, but, you know, particularly as life progresses, these things start to add up. And, you know, it's just and it's it's not that. um you know, all of this stuff is important. It's just then if we're trying to apply this to an individual in front of mm. you to say, you know, one of your future patients, just acknowledging that that all those things start to come into play as well is, is important. I completely agree with what you just said. And I think the, the example was very important and was, yeah. What would you do in that situation of such an individual? If someone is already on the edge all the time and you, you, you ask that individual to exercise, that would be a very stupid idea. And maybe that individual <laughs> helps himself by ha having some alcohol, having some occasional, like, um, I don't know, cigarettes here and there, because it helps that person to calm down. And if you say, stop smoking, it's like, no. I'm rather like, well, a, a uh, whatever, uh, finding a new physician. Because I'm not doing this, I'm stressed out, I need to do something. I mean, it's, as you said, it's a difficult thing to, to sort out. Yeah, I think... Um you know, it, it will depend very much on the healthcare system that, that you work in, right? If you have a, a nationalized uh, healthcare system where people get access to the things they need, it's not the case in the US, uh, mm. but, you know, it is the case in, in most countries in Europe, then I think you have more scope to help them. You know, like maybe, you know, if somebody really does, does have an issue, you know, with cigarettes or alcohol, um, as a coping mechanism, right, you might be able to, there might be some psychological support that that's uh, important there, right? You're as a, you know, you're, you're probably not going to be the only person who's who's going to who's going to be there to, to, to help them or going to be needed to help them. But I, I always think about what's the what's the lowest hanging fruit. Yeah. Um, and and Aim I, low I enough, think yeah. that. Yeah. And, and so, you know, it's it's where can you start like at, at work? Can you take a five minute break uh, and go, you know, walk some stairs or, you know, stand up or, you know, whatever, just like brief movement snacks. Yeah. Most yeah. people can, can, can build that into their day equally. Um, you know, there's some nice uh, work by Ellen Langer that says that, you know, a lot of um, say a lot of service jobs may include a physical component, but you don't appreciate it as exercise because society doesn't tell you that it's exercise. <laughs> right. So she did her study with, um, uh, women who worked uh, cleaning hotel rooms, mm, and to half of them, she, half of them, she said, "Do you know what the work that you're doing, the exercise you're doing at work? This, this is a lot of exercise. Counts as exercise, you know, yeah. Yeah, you know, moving around the car, changing beds, vacuuming rooms. That's hard work. Yeah. And as you know, the group that was told that, actually, some some parts of their health improved. And again, wow. just like acknowledging, actually, they're doing more than they thought they did. That you know, that was kind of the, part of the hypothesis." Yeah, that's so, like coming so back to what we talked at the beginning, being yeah, positive about exactly. what you do and conscious of the fact that oftentimes you do something that's already sufficient to produce certain benefits and you should be, appre you should be appreciative of that already. And yeah. al so, that alone can, can have this placebo effect on you, that positive placebo effect. Yeah, exactly. And so, so it doesn't have to be exercise. It could be anywhere, anything around food or movement or yeah. maybe sleep. You know, can you get to bed 15 minutes earlier? And if you can, that's great. Acknowledge and, you know, accept those benefits and uh, you know and see them because what happens is these things compound over time so people who stop smoking are more likely to start exercising or are, mm. are more likely to uh, eat better people who start exercising are more likely to change their diet oh, and yeah. so if you just create you know wherever it is wherever you can find a little bit of benefit for sleep or social connection you know social connection again critical can these things that you have to do every day can you do some of them with a friend or with a family member, mm. right? Things like that. And just these small changes really start to add up. So don't try and completely change somebody's life, right? Say, well, now you need to exercise every day and you need to cook all your meals um, and I need you to get nine hours of sleep. It's never going to happen, right? But if you can find these small bits that they can start with, then once it's started, it's easy to, it's usually easy to, or easier to add to it than it is to start to it, to right. start it. And even if it's subconsciously as you start to make these some improvements and say hey i'm doing this thing that's it's good for me you know getting this 15 minutes of extra time in bed every night right then you'll start to see these other uh, changes creep in so just you know keep the bar super low yeah. 
focus on the things that that person you know can do every day and then it will start to compound over time right i think that's amazing advice and i think it's very unsexy advice because it's not specific yeah. enough <laughs> it's like <laughs> find the lowest hanging fruit and start there and it will be but i still love it because it it uh, appreciates the the in the individual differences between patients uh that yeah. a physician might encounter um it, re it requires work. you to take a good history, talk and listen to your patient and listen. meet them where they are. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah I've exactly. come to that conclusion too. It's like medical school. Great. Like biochemistry, all these, cl all this clinical stuff. It's like, yeah, fine, fine. I, I get it. It's important. But how about learning how to talk to the to patients, especially when it comes to lifestyle? Because, you know, mm. you know, in medical school, I don't know if you encountered the same thing uh, when you were in medical school, but what we are being taught as far as lifestyle is concerned, is that yeah there is like lots of evidence and it's important and you should do this and you should talk about that with your patients but chances that they're going to listen and implement it are low to begin with so like try it and then let's talk about pharmacology now let's talk about drugs because they are way more powerful and easier to implement just take this pill and you're done and that's true from a psychological perspective that's dead on but i think yeah. the answer is not Stop talking to your patients about lifestyle intervention, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, there's multiple parts of that. You like, in terms of like, in terms of population health in, say, modern high-income countries, the pr the the biggest problem with with uh with uh population health is behavior change. Wow, it's incredibly yeah. hard. Cre like, I you know, I spent years just being like, well, if I gave people better information, they'd be able to fix this stuff. Yeah, absolutely not. Like. Any did like because I've now worked with multiple digital health companies. I've worked with like in multiple different arenas, like uh, health coaching, performance coaching as a doctor. Each of those things, if you want to actually improve the health of the individual, the information matters much less than having them, you know, input from somebody who understands behavior change. Behavior mm. change is like the whole game. Um, and so, so I think that psychology, every... psychology, behavioral psychology to the very core. Yeah, and so like anytime now I work with a digital health company, they're like, we're going to give these people all this information. We're going to collect all their data. This is going to help them <laughs> yeah. change their behavior. Yeah. And like the first thing I say is, how many behavioral psychologists do you have on your team? Because <laughs> the answer is usually zero. And that Ooh. means that whatever they're doing is guaranteed to fail. Like yeah. you, like behavior change ha like has to be front and center. And so that has to be part of the education system. Uh, you, you have to not necessarily, you're not going to turn all medical students into experts in, in psychology, uh, but just having them understand the, like the importance of that access to resources around that, you know, including, you know, there are some, some basics, um, that you could do in terms of, um, history taking, uh, uh, uh techniques, um, uh, the sort of like the, tra the, the trans theoretical model of behavior change, like some of mm -hmm. these things that like where you at the stages of change, right? I think, I think medical students can and should learn that just like, should. you know, this patient is like not in the right space for you to tell them, Hey, yeah. you need to do, a, do, do, do more exercise. Right. I mean, it doesn't and even you can work. Appreciate that I mean, try to away. tell your kid to do something. It will do the opposite. Yeah. I mean, yeah. as far as I can tell, the, psych the psychological phenomenon is that if you tell someone or if you kind of compel the patient to do something, like oftentimes it's, you have to do this or else, right? So, uh, you know, and, and so if you indirectly like, compel the patient to do s certain things, it will be, the patient will even turn even more resistant, render himself more resistant, which, which is very un productive in that situation because both of you would actually have the the, the patient rather be healthier yeah and so, so that's that's part of it right yeah knowing where the person is meeting them where they're at knowing like the the importance and some of these parts of of what's required for behavior yeah. change but then the other part is right the the average like and i can be a little bit mean about the average doctor because I, I am a doctor. Sometimes I get a bit mm. mad when people who haven't been to medical school start like throwing shade at doctors and be like, at least mm. have an appreciation, you know, you should have an appreciation of, of, of what it takes, right, to, to work in the, in the clinical mm. environment because it's it can be very difficult. Mm. But, you know, the average doctor, right, they know, and just like the patient knows, the patient knows that they should eat better. The doctor knows the patient should eat better. Yeah. What does that mean? What does that mean? <laughs> How do you do that? How do you implement that? Just like the doctor knows that the patient should do more exercise the patient already knows they need to do yeah. more exercise but what does that mean like what yeah. does that look like what does more exercise mean and so 
these are some of the other skills that I think could be brought to medical school. And there are a lot of medical schools around the world now that are bringing in lifestyle medicine as part of their curriculum. Mm. Um, and again, that's the way that that's implemented is not always something that I agree with, but it's a start, right? It's start, because yeah, start somewhere, yeah. if you want to tell your patient that they need to do more exercise, you need to be able to say, this is what I mean by more exercise. And this is how you do it. This is how you implement it for you. Yeah. Um, because otherwise it's, it's not going to make any difference. So, so I think there's yeah. a lot, a lot of an education piece in multiple steps that, you know, we have some areas to improve in. Yeah. I really appreciate that while also, uh, touching on some, um, on, on certain like solutions as far as disease and cognitive decline is concerned. We also sp try to specify some major problems in these fields because I think there are, I think it's important to specify these problems because if we just keep keep you know how would you say um isn't there a saying with the horse hammering the ho horse no what was the saying um bet bet no what is it no, like flogging a dead horse is, that is it what, this is that one yeah I think it's it's, it's yeah. this saying you know trying the, the same thing over and over again expecting the same result And now we realize, oh, maybe we, we have the problems w wrong or we haven't specified them enough. So I think there's way more that we have to appreciate that, that, is still, um, that still has to be sorted out um, before talking about specific solutions. But, okay, still, still we, we touched upon a certain things as far as cognitive decline is concerned. One question that I have, um, which, I found very, which I find very fascinating, is the, uh, the effect on movement generally or specifically, a spe general movement or specific movement on cognitive performance and cognitive decline. It, yeah, how is, how so, is the literature uh, on that? I mean, yeah, so the, there's multiple different aspects um, of that. There's um, right acute, um, and then there's also different types of exercise, uh, and then there are different effects. So acutely, um, Exercise and pretty strenuous exercise imp improves cognitive performance, particularly um, things around uh, memory and executive function, up to a certain point, right? Because I I'm sure, right, you've done uh, done some exercise that basically left you feeling like, well, I mean, you're just like this lump of useless meat afterwards, right? The brain <laughs> isn't functioning at all, um, right? So there's there's always like a drop off point, but in general, acutely. Uh, going for, that could be going for a walk or doing some, you know, higher intensity sprints. They, those, those things seem to acutely improve cognitive performance as long as you haven't gone to like true physical failure. Um, then uh, there was a nice uh, meta analysis and meta regression recently that l that looked at like what's the dose minimum effective dose to of, of movement of exercise to prevent cognitive decline. Mm. And actually, they found that it was around about what the standard recommendations are, which is 30 to 45 minutes per day of moderate to vigorous phys physical activities. So mm. uh, the standard government guidelines, that's the minimum effective dose of exercise to uh, significantly decrease the rate of cognitive decline. And then people are like, well, what does moderate to vis vigorous physical mm. activity even mean, right? And that's, a, it's, and that's a really important question. So basically anything that you, your heart rate increases, say like above around 100 beats per minute, 110 beats per minute. Um, and you can have a conversation, but you feel a little out of breath, right? That's moderate physical activity. Mm -hmm. So anything at that level or above. So I think of like brisk walking. Um, and again, what does brisk walking mean? Well, they have a number for that. So brisk <laughs> walking is technically 100 steps per minute or more. So if you want to count it, you can. But again, you could just go, well, I'm walking. I'm out of breath, uh, but I can still hold a conversation, right? That's that's what we're talking. So like 30 plus minutes of that per day. And you can get a similar stimulus from lifting weights, dancing, uh, skateboarding, surfing, like any of those things are all are all great. So that's so for like general brain health, any kind of movement at that level or above 30 minutes a day, that's probably the a, a good target. Right. Um, then there, there are specific studies that look at um, like I, I talked about earlier, um, where they, they did this uh, trial in individuals over 70, and they had them do either resistance training, so it was uh, like twice a week, I think it was six exercises, three sets of eight reps, so like two basic, going 
to a gym, use five or six machines for half an hour kind of resistance training program anybody, that almost anybody can do. Um, that improved cognitive function, um, you know, significantly again in these older adults, you know, they're yeah. 70 plus. So even if you've never done any kind of weightlifting before, you know, go in, use a leg press, a chest press machine, you know, a lat pull down, you know, even those things would probably be uh, enough a couple of times a week for 30 minutes, something like that. Uh, that been shown to significantly improve cognitive function. The final piece is that there's probably an additional benefit mm. from movement that challenges your coordination specifically. Mm. And there's a meta-analysis again um, recently that, that showed this. And there are multiple individual studies that say that if you match exercise for how like cardiovascularly challenging it is, you get more benefits for the brain if there's also a balance component. So things wow. like comparing circuit training to dancing. Dancing for older adults seems to be this amazing thing for the brain because you get a cardiovascular stimulus, but there's also this challenge, like challenge for like motor and coordination that provides additional benefit. Um, so so that's so like if you're only going to do one type of exercise, <laughs> join a dance group. Or do Zumba, or so, or something like that. Do they have Zumba in Germany? Um, well, they do so, have everything. So that's the kind of thing. Yeah, something that has some kind of like a cardiovascular component, but also a, a, a coordination or balance component it seems to be particularly beneficial. Especially as and as you get older, right? That balance is going to be really important to keeping you upright, stop you falling over, breaking yep. your hip, all that kind of stuff. So yeah, that's kind of the. Eh, in as short as I could make it, uh, an overview of, of physical activity and cognitive yeah. function. That was amazing, though, because I think it leaves a lot of uh, possibilities to choose from for people. Because you just said yeah. um, it should be some type of movement. Um, and now you can, you can choose from what you like that is fun yeah. as far as you're concerned, that's engaging, that maybe involves some balance, some coordination. Maybe uh, it's more strength demanding versus um, cardio demanding and you can combine different things. You don't have to be focused only on one. Maybe it's even better. Maybe it's not maybe. Perhaps, perhaps it's way better to do different kinds of things because now you have different stimuli that can vary in their uh, level of being, let's say, cognitively challenging. You know, if you do one thing over and over again, you become really good and that's that. But if you try and learn new skills, as we talked about uh, before, then that alone has additional benefit. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And the, the final piece that I guess I didn't mention, um, yeah, yoga is another thing that come, comes under like physically challenging, but also balance uh, and, and very popular Tai Chi. You know, again, Tai Chi has multiple randomized trials that suggest it has beneficial for a num number of things. But, but all of those things, right, if you think about yoga, tai chi, um, dance classes, most of those usually happen in a group. So mm. there's a social component, right? There's going out and meeting people and interacting with them and doing things, you know, as a group. You know, even if the movement is individual at a time, right, there's this social component doing it as part of a class or part of a group, which has its additional benefits. Um, so, so, like, you can bring all those things together and get multiple different wow. benefits, like skill learning, um, you know, cardiovascular benefit, um, you know, motor benefit, social connection, just by like going to a yoga class, say. And I think yeah. like if you could tick all those boxes, right, that's great. And so, yeah, amazing, brilliant. Yeah. So you say other. So there, there are independent. There's an independent benefit to uh, doing something. Oh fuck off.
fuck that just happened? Ugh. Oh. Oh, you're still here. Hello. Yeah, I'm still here. <laughs> oh, man, my battery was back? empty. Yeah. Give me one second. I don't know what happened. But yeah, it was the battery. Oh, no. Okay. I thought the I closed the room, but it still it still works. Okay, sorry. Just, sorry for I that. Just, I thought it was teams being teams. No, no, no. It was me. It was me forgetting <laughs> to, to charge my laptop. Oh, uh, okay. So I'm sorry. Where did I? Where did it cut you off? Um, we talked about the social aspect. The last question was: Does it yeah. have an independent role? The social. Oh, is, the, the social aspect. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah, so that, that, that's a really great, great question. Um, the again. Independent are, of what you do. Independent of the activity. Yes. Just being in, yeah, a, the, in a group and doing something in a social context. Does that? Does that? Um, uh, result in independent benefit as far as um, like preventing cognitive decline is concerned yeah so is there a randomized controlled trial where they have people dance uh -huh. alone versus dance in a group no um <laughs> as far as i know that study doesn't exist i'd be very interested to, to see it um however there are you know very large meta-analyses that say um being socially isolated or feeling alone uh, having poor social support is associated with an increased risk of cognitive decline and dementia. And the opposite is also true. If you have good social support, you feel socially connected, you don't feel socially isolated, that's associated with a decreased risk of cognitive yeah. decline and dementia. So as much as I could say that, you know, for the average person, going out and joining a dance group, uh, a yoga class where you might make a friend, you know, you might you know, meet some new people, you know, I think there will be an independent benefit there. I don't have a randomized trial to 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 show yeah. you, but you know, at the end of the day, the worst thing that happened was you had a nice time with some <laughs> nice people. At a Horrible! Class, right? Oh no! I think oh, no. I think the risk is pretty. The risk is pretty low. Yeah, you know, and I think I think that's like one of the one of these things where I think, do you really need a randomized controlled trial to 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 make the point that being in a group and being like socially connected to other people, to good people, and having a good time with people? that this produces some some sort of positive benefit really yeah. do you really need to study this sort of thing i mean it's if if there is something that's that's obvious beyond the need to study it i think this and the fact that we need sleep these are two things where it's like yeah we know that obviously i mean yeah. why yeah you could you could come up with ch challenging devil's advocate questions but i still at the end of the day i think what, 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 like, from an evolutionary standpoint, I think there is evidence, though, if you isolate babies, they get extremely sick if they're not oh. with someone, right? Oh, oh yeah. And, and there's the, the opposite is true. There's now, you know, for, for decades, we, we would take sick babies away from their parents and put them in these, what we call them, isolates. You know, there's like little plastic chambers. And they get like, sicker. Keep, and they get sicker. Wow. Um, Didn't or, know that. Well, it's... It's difficult to say they get sicker, but what we know now is there's this, is this big push towards something called kangaroo mother care, which is basically that rather than having the baby isolated, you have the baby on the mother's chest. And you can do all the same stuff, right? They can still be intubated. You can have tubes and lines and all that kind of stuff. But that definitely improves outcomes. Having the babies wow. like connected to – it doesn't have to be the mother even. Any kind of caregiver, like skin-to-skin -skin contact, huge effects on, on babies' health and, and improves their long-term outcomes. Right? There are studies that show – there's a study in Colombia – uh, that showed that adults who were born prematurely that were randomized to this skin to kin skin contact as babies 20 yeah. years earlier they have improved uh, brain volume and brain connectivity right 20 years later
Wow. Uh, and so so can have really, you know, really huge impact. Um, so so yeah, I think and, and you know, if if people are interested in this, you know, you look up the work of Julian Holt Lundstad, there's this big thing on and on uh, the the importance of social connection on our physiology. Um, I'm actually editing a, a special edition of a journal, uh, the mm. Lifestyle Medicine Journal, where we're going to have like all basically the luminaries in like the social support, social connection world, writing papers again, and it will even gives like the physiology, the biochemistry of why social connection is important for human health. So if you want to know mechanism, we do have some of that stuff as well. Or you can nice. just say, well, humans, humans are social beings, therefore, you know, it's important for us to have that for our health. And I think I think that's you know, sufficient that's for most too. people. Yeah, I think that's sufficient for most people. I think oftentimes it's just extremely valuable and sufficient to look back at um, history. There are people that like, like history at evolution. I th there are people that criticize that idea, but I think it's a it's the best idea we have. Looking back yeah. and yeah. looking at yeah, what too. we have done for most of the time and the probability that this uh, is beneficial to some degree, especially if it's extremely conserved among different yeah. species, let's say, because like sleep, everyone does that. And by everyone, I mean every animal out there. Is there, is there an animal that doesn't, doesn't require sleep? Maybe there as is, as, but it's, yeah, yeah exactly. They, uh, as far as I know, like they, they find ways to adapt around it, right? If they're susceptible to, to predators or whatever, but, but right. no, sleep is very important. Right. I think you're, uh, no, I completely agree with you. And there's, there's a very nice quote from uh, Theodosius Dobzhansky, which says that nothing in biology makes sense except for in the except for in the light of evolution or something, yes. right? Like, if you don't understand a problem, just think about some evolutionary context. Um, and I think that helps us put things a lot. In, into place. Yeah, I think the evolutionary lens is very valuable, especially especially medicine, I think. And I think it, it comes way too short as far as discussing like certain functions or medicine in general is concerned. That's how I feel about medical school, school because oftentimes, at least sometimes, that, that, that is the case for certain enzymes or parts of the body where we assume by default that there is no function. For some reason, I don't get it. It's like the appendix. Probably there is no function because we haven't figured it out. I think yeah. the more the smarter, um, more obvious um, default conclusion should be it is conserved in almost every individual, and we it, it, you can make the argument for the appendix or for every enzyme for everything that we have as part of our body. If it's conserved, if it's conserved among all individuals, I mean everyone has a head and two and and I don't know a brain. You know, there might there are variations between the enzyme having this have has uh, having this mutation or this variation. You know, there are slight genetic variations, but there are things that are extremely conserved, and so that means there has to be a function and an explanation. Maybe we mm. haven't figured it out yet, but that should be the default assumption that we or the lens through which we look at the human body. Let's say. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Right. So look, there is. 10,000 more things I would like to discuss with you, but I think we should leave it for another episode, especially in the realm of athletic performance. Also, as far as blood work is concerned, because I have heard you on another episode, I think, or maybe it was you with talking with someone about nuances in blood work as far as athletes yeah. are concerned, because yeah. there are certain things that you need to keep in mind when looking at the blood work from athletes or general blood work is an extremely interesting issue. And there's... Lots of things to discuss. Well, we um, yeah, that's that's uh, another topic that I'm very interested in, and yeah, yeah, well, we can do a we can do a round two and, and, and tackle some of that stuff. Definitely, we should definitely do that. So, uh, final two questions: w What are things coming up for you? What is what is about to happen in your life? Is there anything <laughs> nice? Is there anything ex exciting? There was a competition uh, recently on CrossFit. I yeah, that's that's. One thing that I remember from your Instagram that you recently had that CrossFit competition. Oh no! So I didn't. I did. A, <laughs> so I, I compete in strongman. So it was a strongman. Strong competition. Sorry, it was a strongman competition. Uh, yeah. yeah, but I actually was. I was recently on the CrossFit website. I did. A, I did a, a video yeah. with CrossFit. Uh, I think it was May seven, May seventeenth. Cro uh, CrossFit wad. Um, that we had a guy do the wad, and then I, like during it. As he was like slowly dying, I was like explaining the physiology of like what's <laughs> happening in his body. So like, if anybody <laughs> likes CrossFit, you can go and check out. I think it was May seventeenth was was the was the was the word. Um, Good. So yeah, like at the end of at the end of the summer, um, 
we always go cross country. Mm. We, we we drive across the whole US to the to the East Coast where my wife's family live, and uh, we go to the beach for a week. Uh, we drive so we can take the dogs. So we like do this family road trip out and back. So that's that will come up in about a month or so. That's always a lot of fun. Mm. Um, then. At the end of September, I'm speaking at the British Society of Lifestyle Medicine Conference in London. So anybody in Europe or in the UK uh, listening to this, uh, you should come and listen to that. That's that's going to be pretty good. So those are, the, those are probably the, the things uh, coming up that I'm looking forward to. Awesome. Well, um, really, I was re I'm really excited to have you on today. And it was a great conversation we had. And I'm, gla I'm glad we at least... Uh, well, we, we, we came up with certain things that are hopefully helpful for people, but we also came mm. up with a more specific description of the problems that are still out there and still aren't resolved yeah. fully. And the last question is where people can find more about your work. So where are you as far as social media goes? And maybe there are certain specific um, things uh, from your research that you would like to point towards. So anything that you would advise people to look up to find more about you. Uh, yes. So I probably post most frequently on Instagram. Mm. So I'm at Dr. Tommy Wood on Instagram. Mm. Um, it's, it's very variable. Like sometimes I'll, I'll post on my main feed and sometimes it'll just be pictures of my dog or the gym yeah. <laughs> uh, in my stories. Uh, so dog, if you're interested yeah. in, in that, if you're interested in my, in my boxes, uh, mm. come to Instagram. Um, I mean, if anybody's interested in, in like the academic work that I do, usually if yeah. I, when I publish a new paper, I, I'll post that. Uh, on Instagram as well, uh, or you know, you can find me in, in PubMed, or shoot me a shoot me. Feel free to shoot me an email, shoot me a, a DM. I, I usually respond to all my DMs on Instagram. I'm, you know, I don't get that many, so it's it's usually okay. not too hard to okay, uh, okay. to to respond. Um, so yeah, and I, I usually, if you have any questions, just just let me know. Awesome. Well, I guess I guess that's a good place to stop. So great. Well, yeah. Thanks for having me. I, I really enjoyed this. It was a very uh, it was a really nice conversation. Thanks a lot for coming on.